Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Mark Levin, president of MUIH. I'd like to thank you all for attending our seventh annual research symposium. MUIH's support and commitment to academic and clinical research has grown consistently in recent years. We have made great strides in accomplishing many of the goals on the university's five-year strategic plan for research, including expansion of research capabilities and engagement. The annual research symposium has served as a cornerstone of this work by providing opportunities for students, alumni, and faculty from all academic disciplines to add to the research evidence on the importance of integrative health. And research is one of our strategies under our strategic planning goals. Our annual event that you are attending showcases original research, summary research, case reports, and research proposals by our graduate students, alumni, and faculty. This year, our panel of judges, which is made up of MUIH's provost, Dr. Christina Sachs, health and wellness coaching chair, Dr. Dustin Mars, and they were joined by our keynote speaker, Kimberly Middleton, a talented clinical researcher from NIH to select two winning posters, one from our faculty presentations and one from the student alumni presentation. In addition to our keynote speaker tonight, you will also hear from this year's Faculty Research Excellence Award winner, Dr. Heidi Most from the Acupuncture and Herbal Medicine Department. Lastly, Dr. Stephanie Munaz, who has been instrumental in growing research here at MUIH, will share an update on faculty research accomplishments accomplishments over the past year. After tonight's presentations, the poster session will be live for a full week, giving us all the opportunity to communicate online with the author about the work. Thank, thank you so much for being here. And now I'll turn it over to Stephanie, who will introduce our keystone, our esteemed keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, appreciate the introduction. It is my pleasure and my honor to introduce tonight's keynote. She is, as you will hear, an esteemed researcher and also a dear friend and collaborator. Uh, so I was thrilled when the steering committee selected her for this year's presentation that is a topic um, very much of importance to MUIH leadership and faculty and students and the world at large. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we were able to bring her. Her longer uh, bio is available on the site that we're gonna be using for this event all week long. So to get right to her, I'm gonna keep her bio introduction brief and share that Ms. Kimberly Middleton has served as a nurse research specialist at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center since 2007. She created and served as the principal investigator on a clinical trial entitled, A Pilot Study of Yoga as Self-Care for Arthritis in Minority Communities. Her background as a survey methodologist, health disparities researcher, mindful self-compassion teacher, and yoga instructor trained in Kripalu Yoga. At the federal level, in addition to NIH, she, she has worked as a health scientist for the CDC National Center for Health Statistics, focusing on establishment-based surveys related to pediatric emergency department preparedness and ambulatory care. Ms. Middleton is a registered nurse with over 30 years of clinical experience. She holds both a master's of public health from Columbia University and a master's of science in survey methodology from the University of Maryland College Park. With that, I will turn it over to Ms. Kimberly Middleton for her keynote presentation. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Dr. Munoz, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Are you able to see it? Yes. Okay. Let me get rid of some of the extra stuff going on here. So my talk today will be perspectives on health disparities research and integrative health. As Dr. Muna said, I'm Kimberly Middleton. I'm from the NIH. I am a research nurse specialist and survey methodologist within the translational biobehavioral and health disparities branch. I'm also a yoga teacher and a mindful self-compassion teacher. I have no conflicts of interest and everything that I say here is my own opinion and not that of my employer. I need to be clear about that. 
first I'm gonna just go over some concepts related to health disparities, things such as implicit bias, structural racism, and microaggressions. I'm also gonna talk about health disparities, health equity, social determinants of health and community-based research. And then the bulk of my discussion will be about two studies. One, yoga is self-care for arthritis in minority communities, which was an acceptability and feasibility study and a faith-based community feasibility study called DC Cooks with Heart. So I like this slide as we are starting to have more trainings about implicit bias. And just to uh, put in our minds that for the most part, we end up talking about things like nationality, ethnicity, gender identity, race, and disability. But just to think about, there's a lot going on under the surface that's informing our perceptions and what we're talking about, even though we might not ever really talk about it, just to um, open up the idea that these things are there kind of lurking under the surface. With microaggressions, this is a word that you're hearing a little more now than before. And I wanted to point out that part of the definition is that it's insensitivities by potentially well-meaning individuals that communicate hostile or negative attitudes and insults. And I think um, with the confirmation hearing of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, it was very clear that there were some microaggressions going on there. So there's not a uh, need to get too far into it. But two examples might be something like continuing to mispronounce a student's name even though they've corrected you, or making the assumption that all people of color are poor and need some kind of financial assistance. Two additional concepts, one structural marginality, which is a relatively new term, is switch shifting the focus from the individual's responsibility for say, cardiovascular disease and looking to see maybe what's going on with structures and institutions that might be influencing health disparities. And another term that we're hearing more is structural racism. And uh, just to talk about that in terms of the normalization and legitimization of historical and cultural and institutional uh, concepts that impact community, society, and our history as a whole. And to think about it in terms of things like power, access, opportunities, whether or not they're intentional. I love this slide, I saw this years ago and I thought this just says it all in one picture. Uh, earlier in public health, we were talking about equality with the concept that if we just split everything up equally and give it to everybody that that would solve the issue. But over time, we've realized that what we really wanna aim for is equity. And that is giving each person what they need even if it's a little bit different for each person. And so this goes into the conversation about health equity, which is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health, and that no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or socially determined circumstances. And so that concept socially determined circumstances leads us into the talk about social determinants of health, which if you think about it are conditions in which which people live, where we're born, where we grow, where we work, um, and how that impacts our daily life. Some things to also think about are the forces and uh, systems that might be at play like economic policies, social norms, social policies, and even political systems. For the most part in public health, we talk a lot about housing and transportation. We might talk about education. Pollution and air quality has come up in the past and also a discussion about literacy, specifically health literacy. But more so um, in the present, we're starting to look more at racism and discrimination. And there's always been a discussion about diet and physical activity, but now the focus is shifting more towards nutritious foods, which I'll talk about later in my presentation. I can't see all of this. <laughs> So I created this slide, this timeline, because it helped me to make sense of what I understand about health disparities and how long this has been going on. And so it was interesting to find out that all the way back in 1985, there was a con congressional report, which came to be known as the Heckler Report, that put forward the idea that there were truly health disparities. And uh, what the committee had gone out and measured what the disparities were and what populations were at risk and some guidelines about what should be done to eliminate disparities. And so again, I wanna highlight this started in 1985. 
So one thing that came of that report was that the uh, Office of Minority Health was established in Health and Human Services, and along with some of the other agencies. But the, the concept was that they were dedicated to improving minority health through policies and programs. So this is 1986, 1990, we're moving forward. We get to 2003 and the Institutes of Medicine puts out a report that's called Unequal Treatment. And so while we're trying to figure out why disparities exist and what can we do about policies, this report comes out and says, let's look at what's going on in the clinical setting. Are there any biases, stereotypes or prejudice that are going on within the clinical setting that might be impacting, sorry, trying to, that might be impacting um, clinical care. And this report did actually find that that was happening. So then we're moving forward from 2003, we're in 2010. And in the background, CDC has been putting out reports every uh, 10 years called the Healthy People Reports. So in 2010 is the first place that I could find that um, there was a discussion about the elimination of health disparities, that this was gonna be one of the goals along with health promotion and disease prevention, but also eliminating health disparities came out in, uh, 20, in Healthy People 2010. Another significant thing in 2010 was the Affordable Care Act. And that's talked about in many different ways, but on my next slide, I'm gonna specifically highlight things that happened in terms of health equity related to the Affordable Care Act. And then in 2016, just to highlight the non-discrimination in health programs and activities. And the idea there was that the final rule put forth is the act that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. So this kind of puts some teeth into it in, to, in that we're not just talking about it, that it exists, we're actually moving towards prohibiting discrimination. And so this is the slide I was talking about with the Affordable Care Act, just to highlight some of the things related to health equity that came forward in this law. So one was increasing insurance covering and coverage and expanding access prohibiting discrimination in healthcare, which we just talked about, addressing diversity and cultural competency in the workforce, as, along with enhancing data collection and research, strengthening the federal minority health infrastructure, specifically related to the Office of Minority Health, not only the office within HHS, but also establishing offices within six of the other agencies within HHS. And for us at NIH, a major change was that we went from having a national center of minority health to a national institute, which uh, kind of moves them up in the, um, in the in priority and gives them more resources. So I love NIMHD's website. I go there often and steal information to put into my slides. But for the most part, what I do enjoy is that they're focusing the conversation about health disparities. It's not just that we're keeping track of what's going on is what are we doing about it? How can we make a change? How can we measure it? And so these are some of the concepts that I found out there. There's actually a definition for health disparities research. But what I think is more useful is there's actually measures for health disparities. When we talk about that there are disparities between populations, what exactly are we talking about? So things like higher incidence and prevalence of disease, premature excess mortality, greater burden of disease or reduced quality of life years, another way to measure it, and poor daily function. Also, there tends to be some difference in who we're talking about when we talk about populations that have health disparities. And so I like that NIMHD kind of outlines, this is who we're talking about. Racial and ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, less privileged socioeconomic status, and also geographically or culturally isolated residents. So now we'll actually move into, that's my whole background spiel. Now we'll move into the actual research that has been done. This is the study that I believe I was asked to come talk about, yoga is self-care for arthritis in minority communities. It was a pilot study to examine the feasibility and acceptability of yoga for urban minority, both English and Spanish speaking population um, of adults with arthritis. 
some of the outcomes were that we validated the impact of having a multicultural interdisciplinary team, which I'll talk a little bit more in, in a moment. But this was the first study to ever look at this population, specifically minorities with arthritis that do yoga. And so the recruitment and retention rates and outcome measure error rates that we were able to produce can be used for future research. When I talk about a cultural infrastructure, it was that we built a multicultural research team. We had translators and bilingual, bilingual materials and classes trying to facilitate trust among the population that we were trying to reach. But I really do believe that one of the stronger aspects of our study is that we had two bicultural interpreters, these two here, Regina and Miriam. They'll probably kill me that I still have their pictures on my slides. Um, but they, I believe, um, made it easier for participants to enroll, made them more comfortable with enrolling and also helped with the retention um, on our study. And if you want more information about what that study contained, we have a paper written about that. So this was the pamphlet that we used to recruit. And I wanna uh, bring your attention to, it was translated into Spanish, making it clear that everything we did was translated, our consent form, any um, recruitment materials, our yoga manual had been translated, as well as um, anything that went home with the participants, their diaries, everything had been translated and we had English and Spanish. The main thing that I wanna bring your attention to for this slide is that our study was started in 2012. And I went to the internet looking for images of people of color doing yoga and there were absolutely none. Not only were there no people of color, there were no full figured people doing yoga on the internet. So everyone you see here, these are my colleagues. Um, they came to a conference room for uh, one day and let me pose them in yoga poses and take pictures so that I would have um, pictures of people of color doing yoga in order to promote my study. So when I say interdisciplinary multicultural, I thought if I gave you the, the names of the people on the study, it would help you to better understand what I mean by that. So for interdisciplinary, there was the nursing department. And then we also had practitioners from the National Institute of Arthritis, Musculoskeletal and Skin, that's a mouthful, um, NIAMS, I'll say that from here on out, and rehabilitation medicine who were actively uh, involved in our study. So in terms of multicultural, it was, um, we had uh, practitioners who were black, meaning African-American, West African and West Indian. And then the contingent that were bilingual were from El Salvador, Mexico, Peru and Puerto Rico. And for rehab medicine, this was the first time in the literature that yoga and rehab medicine had been put together for a clinical trial. And so we were able to write a paper about that experience of bringing these two disciplines together. This person should be familiar to most of you, Dr. Stephanie Munaz. When I met her, she was just completing her research at Johns Hopkins, looking at the efficacy of offering yoga to patients with arthritis, with um, RA and OA arthritis. And she did find positive results um, in her study. However, um, her study was not specifically designed to address minority participation. And while this study had a diverse participant pool and was conducted in an area that's similar to Washington DC where our study um, uh, uh, was put forth, Stephanie's study was done in uh, Baltimore. And when her study was concluded, what she found was that the strongest predictor for attrition was minority race. And so when I contacted her and said that we were doing a study specifically trying to recruit and retain minorities, she was interested in what we would be doing to um, make that possible. So this is the process. NIAMS already had a clinic out in the community where they were offering rheumatology care. So we went to that clinic for, to recruit participants for the yoga study. After we did the initial enrollment in the community, they came to the clinical center only to do the rehab assessment. The physiatrist wanted the patients to come to their clinic so that she could assess them there. But the rest of the study took place out at a yoga studio in Washington, DC. The classes were offered twice a week for eight weeks. Class sizes were small, five people or less and there was always a Spanish interpreter present. So this is just an overview of what amount of information we were collecting um, 
in our study, it always seems like a lot when I see it on this slide. Um, during enrollment, which again was out in the community, we uh, did first the in, informed consent. And there are a bunch of measures that I thought would be useful to better understand this patient population along with the rehab assessment. Then participants came to the yoga studio for eight weeks, um, had eight weeks of the yoga class along with doing a home journal which was just how often were they practicing at home for how long? And then they were able to write a narrative like a diary, just their time being on the study, anything they wanted to tell us about doing yoga. At week eight in the yoga studio, we collected the same measures again. And then uh, we had an exit interview. And then three months later, we, we followed up to see who was still doing yoga and if they had any questions or any information for us after three months. So this was the conceptual model. Initially, what I thought uh, would be the impact of offering yoga. So like I said, I, I had all this idea of what variables I needed to collect up front. And I thought that taking this eight week yoga intervention would impact self-care in terms of a health behaviors measure and self-efficacy in terms of confidence in doing yoga. Our sample size was much too small to talk about significant relationships. However, we did find that some of the patient reported measures that we selected did point to self-efficacy. And so during our final write-up, we did suggest some of those measures for future research. So as I said, this was a feasibility study. And what we did find is that the yoga protocol designed by Dr. Munaz for her uh, Johns Hopkins population in Baltimore was adaptable and practical to use with this urban multicultural population. We also were able to determine the appropriateness of some physical and psychosocial measures and also to make recommendations about maybe ones to not use in the future because they didn't um, yield positive results for us. And then for practicality, we um, kept records of patients who were invited to enroll but declined. We had a whole lot of field notes. We kept documentation about any yoga modifications that we needed for this population with rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. Again, we had exit interviews and we also kept track of scheduling issues. Um, and so not only was this a feasibility study, it was an acceptability study. And so seeing if the participants found yoga to be acceptable, what we found were the best facilitators for participating, for even wanting to enroll, was that they already had a trusted relationship with their rheumatologist or the rehab medicine practitioner, which is where we got most of our referrals. Um, in the qualitative feedback from participants, having the multicultural infrastructure did help them to feel comfortable with um, both enrolling and staying on our studies and, and taking classes in the community. And there were several comments about how much they appreciated having a yoga protocol that was created for people living with arthritis and to take classes with other people who also had arthritis. Some of the barriers were misconceptions about the cost, especially safety, Upon first talking to anyone about yoga, the first thing we heard most time was about the pretzel poses. So it helped that we had the pamphlet showing all of the props that we would be using during class to make it less intimidating. The yoga studio was in Washington, DC. And so we had people coming from Virginia and Maryland at times that posed some transportation difficulties. There were scheduling conflicts related to work and childcare. And so we did offer evening and some weekend classes. And there was one instance of religious beliefs being a barrier, which I'll talk about on my next slide. But overall for the study, we did feel that this was um, feasible to offer yoga to this population. Three months following up with participants who completed the entire study, they were still doing yoga three months later. All of them were still doing yoga three months later. And then we were testing using an iPad instead of using paper um, to collect uh, the survey instruments, and we did find that that was a feasible method of data collection. So this was the person who left our study for religious reasons. She specifically said the yoga studio made her uncomfortable. She thought the teacher's beliefs were being imposed on her. She did not like doing yoga in front of the statue, which is Patanjali, which you can see just above Charlene's head here, that she thought was diabolic. 
And she just thought in general, she wasn't sure what yoga was and she just thought it was gonna be a different experience. And so her leaving our study kind of made us pause and think, did we do something wrong? Were we not being clear about what we were offering? Should we cover the statue? Um, just a lot of questioning we did about our process. And in the end, we decided that we had been clear about what we were offering. This was not a, an exercise class. It was not a stretching class. It was a yoga class. And so there were going to be some aspects of spirituality as part of it. No one else um, during the study had difficulty with any of the um, statues or the yoga studio, but we decided that if, if someone asked, we would, you know, have a discussion about why there were statues in this yoga studio. This is a Kundalini yoga studio, but we continued on with the study without changing anything, but the um, person leaving kind of rocked us a little bit, and we wanted to publish our discussion to see if um, others were having similar issues and maybe how they resolved it, just to start the discussion. About halfway through our study, again, we were working with rheumatoid and osteoarthritis, uh, people living with those two diseases. Another rheumatologist, Dr. Hasney, uh, came to me and he said, you know, I work with patients who have lupus and I think yoga would be good for them. Would you add them to your study? And so as I uh, tried to learn a bit more about lupus, it's an autoimmune disease that leads to widespread inflammation and tissue damage more common and severe in Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians, which would be perfect for our study. Even though they might be medically controlled, a complaint that Dr. Hasney was seeing with his patient population was fatigue and pain. And in the literature, it talked about how exercise could help with fatigue and improve sleep quality. And so we were able to um, get an amendment to add patients with lupus to our study. The article that we wrote shares the experience of the participants who came to our study along with the clinicians who have been working with um, uh, people living with lupus. And fortunately, we were also able to contact some instructors who were yoga instructors and also had lupus to tell us some about how they modified um, their yoga practice themselves. In conclusion, what we found, there was one other study in the literature that was also based on Dr. Munaz's um, protocol for RA and OA, they had modified her study for lupus also in Canada. And so like them, we found that it was feasible to modify um, the protocol for this patient population. One interesting thing that we found was that we were going to have to modify all of our intake forms because the disease process is completely different. So we just needed better questions upon um, intake. But some uh, suggestions for adapting our study was that when um, people living with lupus feel are feeling good, they want a vigorous pace class, something like a vinyasa flow. For the most part, this is a younger cohort than what we found in the RAOA group. They had less mobility issues and they wanted more time stretching. This cohort had tremendous balancing, balancing potential. And so they wanted more balancing poses and to go deeper into the poses. So we thought about expanding the class from 60 minutes to 90 minutes. There was a suggestion to start each class with the meditation to give um, those living with lupus the chance to um, do an energy assessment and figure out for themselves what would be the best um, amount to put forth into their yoga practice for the day. To teach restorative poses, cooling breaths, and deep breathing in every class so that when or if someone did actually go into a flare period that they knew how to do restorative poses and they could make that choice for themselves because they had already been taught it in their regular yoga classes. And then there was also this discussion about could we possibly have one class with mixed ability or offer several classes with mixed ability, at least um, offering some kind of high intensity component, which would be a vinyasa, something that would be middle, gentle, kind of like the classes that were established for those with RNOA, and then something that would be very low, um, uh, a very low energy practice, which would essentially be restorative. So now we're switching gears from the yoga study and moving into what is, um, what I wanna talk about is community-based participatory research. And basically it's, the researcher going into the community and talking with those who live there and asking them, this is what I'm thinking about doing. 
Do you think this is a good idea? Is there something else that would be more important for your community? And how can we work together to figure out something that's useful and practical and meaningful for your community? And that can be going to community-based organizations if they already exist, groups such as churches or neighborhood organizations. And it's even possible to talk with community residents if they're willing to meet with the researchers to talk about how the study is put together, how to recruit subjects, and then what's gonna be done in terms of whatever um, intervention you're offering or research project that you're offering, but making sure that you're constantly talking to those in the community and getting their feedback and taking that into consideration. So at NIH, our champion for doing this is Dr. Tiffany Powell Wiley. She's a cardiologist from National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. And she has a study called the Heart Healthy Study in Washington, DC, specifically in wards five, seven, and eight, because the, these wards have the highest obesity prevalence rates. There's also limited resources in physical act, uh, for physical activity and healthy nutrition in these wards. And so she's specifically going to these areas to recruit. Um, a major thing that Tiffany um, has done in terms of building trust with this community is that she's established a community advisory board that started in 2012, and we call it the DC CHOC, the DC Cardiovascular Health and Obesity Collaborative. It's made up of multidisciplinary researchers from NIH, but more importantly, university faculty, predominantly from Howard University, and church leaders from this predominantly African-American faith-based community in Washington, DC. Originally, the group met quarterly at Howard University, co-led by Dr. Powell Wiley and someone from the community. But, um, but lately we've been, we've been meeting on Zoom because of COVID. So Dr. Nicole Farmer came through what we call the DC Chalk with a research idea Looking at Ward 7 and 8, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but these are considered food deserts in that for Ward 7, there are only two grocery stores in the entire ward. And for Ward 8, there's only one. And so uh, Dr. Nicole Farmer wanted to know what is the quality of the food that people are receiving in these neighborhoods? And what are people doing to um, have healthier food if it's not available in the community? Where, how are people cooking at home? Are they eating out? What is it that they're doing in order to maintain a, a healthy diet? And how is this affecting the cardiovascular status? Uh, so uh, Nicole came up with this study, DC Culinary Opportunities Within the Kitchen Study. We call it DC Cooks because that's a mouthful. Again, this is an acceptability and feasibility study. It has several parts to it. The first part is the focus group, which we just completed in 2021. The rest of this has been on hold because of COVID. We do want to go into the community to offer this study, but just to tell you how it's set up. The initial visit would be that participants would come to the clinical center, to the hospital at NIH for a dietary assessment to evaluate their cooking skills with rehab medicine and to actually do blood work to see um, what their cardiovascular risks are before starting the intervention. The intervention is six weeks. We are planning to do it in Ward 7 at a church in Ward 7. It's led by a chef who is from that area using a Mediterranean diet. While uh, participants are on the study, they would also be doing diaries at home and we would be collecting grocery receipts. And then after they've completed the intervention, they would come back to NIH for the same assessment to see if there's been a change. So uh, like I said, the focus group was completed in 2021. We got to talk to 20 women um, virtually. We did virtual focus groups. Looking um, to better understand the social determinants of health for this specific um, neighborhood, and if there were things such as food access and food insecurity, how that was impacting them from their point of view. And what they had to tell us about diet quality, um, their, how often they were cooking at home, just trying to get a better understanding of what they were eating and how they were preparing their food and where they were getting food from. Um, we uh, have questions, we have surveys for this study that we want to use. And this focus group was the opportunity to talk to them and say, you know, what do you think about the surveys? Are we asking the right questions? Would you suggest other questions that we, um, that we add to our study? 
And what we found with these focus groups is just that we had an idea of what we were going to study. These women gave us so much information. We have 400 pages worth of information that we're looking through. And it's just more of a multifaceted um, issue than we ever uh, thought or planned for. So it was wonderful being able to talk with them and get more information. This is just a quick preliminary look at some of the quotes that the women gave us. Specifically, um, some of the themes were limited food resources. Again, these are people who live in Ward 7 and 8. They're going as far as Ward 1 to get food. Some are going to Virginia. Some are going to Maryland. One woman drives 60 minutes to go get food that she thinks is healthier for her family. Utilization of community resource, resources. It was wonderful to find out that some of the younger women who didn't learn to cook within their family had met older women in the community that would fix food for them or they would barter. The younger women would go shopping and then the older women would teach them how to cook. There were many quotes that talked about um, different people altering their diet based upon health concerns. And then a topic that came up that we hadn't anticipated was um, what we're calling local politics and neighborhood policies. We're still trying to flesh that out, but trying to understand why is it that there's only, you know, two grocery stores in one ward and one in another, like what is going on if this is the case? So in conclusion, after all of that, I thought I'd leave you with some ideas of how to build trust in communities based upon our experience um, in the Washington DC area. And so the best thing I think is to communicate with those who are already in the community and have trusted uh, relationships. Um, when you're creating your messaging, whatever your marketing tools are gonna be, that you're using the images and the languages that relate to the culture of the people that you're trying to re reach, like in the pamphlet when we had to um, have the day long photo shoot in order to get pictures of people of color. When we're talking about concordance, to match across multiple social characteristics, not just race. I hear a lot about racial concordance as if that's all you need, but my suggestion would be to try to match with multiple social characteristics. And then once you decide what it is you're gonna to do, to think about, to strongly think about offering whatever intervention you're offering within the community, to go into schools and the community health centers and the churches where your participants are comfortable, not asking them to come to you to participate. Whatever intervention you're thinking about to give some time to what is the cost to your participant, you really don't want them to have to pay to uh, participate in whatever you're offering. So is there equipment that you need to purchase for them? Do you need to build incentives for childcare and transportation into whatever budget you're creating? To think about generalizability, not only do you need a large, a large enough sample size, but you need people from diverse populations if you want to say that your results are generalizable. And then after your intervention is completed to go back and evaluate, did you really have an impact on reducing health disparities for this population? And that was my last slide. I will stop sharing and take questions. Thank you so much for that, Kimberly. <laughs> Um, take a sip of water, but go ahead. Absolutely, go ahead and take a sip of water <laughs> while I uh, formulate the first question for you. So um, this one's pretty straightforward. What was the type of yoga that was used in the yoga study? So the yoga was a combination of Dr. Munah's experience and my own. So uh, Dr. I keep calling you Dr. Munah. I have to be very careful not to drop into Stephanie. Um, it's so fine Stephanie to call me Stephanie. Is integral yoga, yeah. and then mine is Kripalu. And then underneath of it all is Iyengar because we just use a lot of props, um, bolsters and blankets and chairs and straps and everything that you can possibly think of we used. And that comes from a, more of an Iyengar base. Great. So there's a, a question here. I'd love to know how you assess cooking skills. Um, the uh, questioner says, I've been asked to work with a group of women that reside in a group home teaching them healthy cooking. So um, what might you offer about assessing cooking skills in that context? Yeah, I knew this was going to be an issue by me talking about Dr. Farmer's study. And so the, the concept was to bring in rehabilitation medicine because they have a whole cooking kitchen that they use for other reasons. But 
we just wanted to know how well the person had knife skills, like were they safe cooking, um, um, cutting with a knife and cutting board. It's just to see functionally if the person was going to be safe. We're going to be out in the community in a church, and we just need to know ahead of time how careful we need to, could they lift a heavy pot, just doing some basic occupational therapy, doing some basic assessment on what, what it is that this person could do in terms of cooking. Great, thank you. Um, you to elaborate on something that you mentioned, Kimberly, when it comes to the the case study that was published about the spiritual elements, uh -huh. um, because you know um, that the IRB that this was sent to specifically requested that spiritual components of the intervention be removed. And, um, you know, many of us here at MUIH consider spiritual health and spirituality to be an important part of integrative health, which kind of sets it apart from conventional medicine. So do you have any suggestions for how to include spiritual elements in a way that is not threatening or divisive? Or do you think this was just a rogue incident that couldn't have been helped? Um, it's funny, I'm wanting to pull you in on this conversation because you were a part of this. So the IRB specifically said we had to remove things like we could not chant OM, we did not use Sanskrit. There were specific things that we could not do um, if the IRB was going to approve this study. But again, we didn't want this to be, it's not a stretching class, it's not an um, exercise class. We wanted to stay as true to yoga as we possibly could. And so other than those things, Everything else about it was a regular yoga class. And it was just this one person who left the study. Um, we went on to have the study for several more months and this wasn't an issue again. And so I think what we came to as a group was just to talk about it. Don't hide it. Don't pretend like it didn't happen. Someone was upset enough that they left. But for the most part, what we were offering was useful. And even if it was it did have a spiritual component for other people. They did. They kept coming back and continued to do yoga three months after they had finished the study. And so maybe not just shy away from it, but just be aware that it is something that might be a barrier for some. But I, 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 my overall suggestion was to just keep doing what you're doing. Great. OK, I'll, we'll take a couple more. Um, you mentioned in a sample you mentioned a small sample size in the first study and a lack of statistical significance in the second i think did you find clinical significance that could be relevant to integrative health practitioners i think okay it's been a long time since i wrote the paper on this study what we found for the most part for the yoga study was a lot of the measures that we used we were looking at depression we were looking at um self-efficacy, we were looking at, uh, I just don't remember everything we had, but we were able to find that some of the measures did show an effect. There was a change from baseline to after the intervention. And so that's not proof that this is a change, again, because our sample size is so small, but the suggestion was those measures that showed some kind of change might be useful um, for anyone else doing future research. The, and Stephanie, you'll have to help me with this. The self-efficacy one that we use was just a generic one. And right after we published, there was a yoga self-efficacy um, measure that came out. And so we made the recommendation that maybe you wanna use something that's more yoga specific. Um, okay, so Kimberly, I wanna ask you one more. I can't get to everything. Sorry, um, everybody for that. Um, many practitioners, many clinicians in integrative health are white. Um, integrative health is predominantly used by white people in this country and in Western countries in general. Um, and I think that oftentimes people who are white who want to make their practices more accessible, more available to diverse populations, struggle with how to do that in an appropriate way. You had a slide with a lot of recommendations that someone could use, but I wonder if you could speak specifically to cautions for white people who are aiming to recruit diverse populations, whether it's for their clinical practice or community programs or research, so as to avoid co-opting culture, acting the white savior, et cetera. So any thoughts you can share about that? That's a huge question. And so 
what I can say with some sense of confidence is that all of the um, PIs that I've talked about today, Dr. Tiffany Powell Wiley, Dr. Nicole Farmer, and myself are all African American. And we were going into African American communities and Hispanic communities. And it took a lot of time building trust. Like I showed you on that slide, Dr. Tiffany Powell Wiley has been meeting quarterly with her DC Chalk group for 10 years now. And so my best suggestion, again, is to partner with those who are already in the community, but you also have to put in the time to build trust and to listen to what it is that they say that they want and what they need. To not think that because you are the practitioner or because you are the researcher that you know best, to be humble and to go in and listen to what it is that they want and to listen when they tell you, this is how our people will come to you. They will only come to a church. They're not, they told us flat out, they are not gonna come to NIH to take a yoga class. And so that's why we offer yoga in the community. So my best um, suggestion is to take the time to build relationship and to listen to those who are trying to tell you what they need and what they want. Great, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us and for being willing to serve as our keynote this evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to now that everyone is refreshed and hydrated and stretched, turn the mic over to Dr. Chris Sachs, our provost. Thank you, Stephanie. And it is my pleasure now to announce the recipients of MUIH's annual Student and Faculty Research Poster Awards. The, uh, this year, we had 14 student posters and five faculty posters in five areas, literature reviews, original research, case reports, study designs, and intervention designs. Um, I thank everyone who submitted a poster for their scholarly work and their commitment to forwarding integrative health through research. And I encourage everyone to, at some point in the next week, to please visit the site, um, look at everyone's posters, and interact virtually with each one of the uh, poster authors. So the recipient of our student poster award is a case report titled Thyrotoxicosis Following High Dose with Ania Somnifera Supplementation by authors Kylie Curry, Lara McNeil, Anna Flores, who are all students in MUIH's Doctor of Clinical Nutrition program. Uh, everyone, please join me in congratulating Kylie, Lara, and Anna. And now, the recipient of our faculty poster award is an intervention design titled Development of a Flexible Yoga Therapy Protocol for Pairing with Acupuncture Therapy to Help Manage Chronic Pain by authors Stephanie Munoz and Tanisha Luthria. Congratulations, Stephanie and Tanisha. Again, everyone, please uh, welcome, I mean, please join me in congratulating uh, not just the recipients of these awards, but everyone who prepared, who conducted research over the last year and prepared a poster. And now it is my honor to introduce the recipient of MUIH's annual Faculty Excellence in Research and Scholarship Award, Dr. Heidi Most, Professor of Acupuncture and Herbal Medicine. Heidi earned her doctorate in acupuncture from MUIH. As a professor at MUIH, she has developed and taught courses for the acupuncture and herbal medicine, integrative sciences, nutrition, and health and wellness coaching programs. She has been an investigator on two research projects and the author of three papers published in peer reviewed journals. She is also an editor of the fourth edition of Chinese Acupuncture and Moxibustion by Chang Zhang and is chair of the International Special Interest Group on Education of the Society for Acupuncture Research. Please join me in welcoming Heidi as she tells us more about her research. Thank you, Heidi. 
And thank you so much, Chris. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and there we go. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks so much to our wonderful keynote speaker and congratulations to our faculty and student award winners. It's really wonderful to see research happening here at NUIH. So my presentation is on creating a model acupuncture research curriculum. Why, what, how, and lessons learned. I'm gonna cover five different topics. Why students need to learn about acupuncture research. Who funds the research? Challenges in acu research developing a model acupuncture research curriculum and lessons learned. And I'm hopeful that um, a, a lot of what I'm talking about is actually ap applicable to anybody who's interested in curriculum development. So it's very important to be teaching acupuncture research to acupuncture students for a number of reasons. It makes them better practitioners, advocates, and healthcare team members and research team members. It teaches them that they are researchers every time they treat a patient, because when they walk into the treatment room, and when all of us as practitioners walk into a treatment room, we're saying, how can I help this patient? And then after the treatment, we analyze the data. Did I help? Did, my, did this treatment help my patient? There will be able to answer people who dismiss acupuncture as just a placebo. They learn to see the importance of adding modern understanding to ancient wisdom. After all, acupuncture was developed several thousand years ago. Since then, our knowledge has expanded tremendously. Our environment is quite different than it was in ancient China. Uh, we have um, uh, indoor air conditioning and indoor heating, which changes the environment tremendously, and a very different population. Of course, here in the United States, we have a very heterogeneous population, unlike what existed in ancient China. So uh, much has changed since the early development of acupuncture. Also, research helps them to understand different worldviews. So this is so important. I want to spend a minute on uh, what that actually means, because different worldviews give rise to different medical systems and different types of research. Of course, this is simplified uh, because to really go into a Western and Eastern worldview would take much more time, but very simply, from an Eastern worldview, the part can treat the whole. The human body, mind, and spirit is intertwined with itself and with the world and the cosmos. The medical system that arises from that treats the whole body, mind, and spirit and the person within the environment. And the research, therefore, that is needed to study such a system needs to be pragmatic, qualitative, and look at the whole person. So something like whole systems research might be applicable. On the other hand, the Western uh, worldview puts great emphasis on studying and understanding the basic building blocks of life. What we can measure is of utmost importance. The medical system that arises from that treats the part, right? It treats the part that's not functioning. And the research that's appropriate for that looks at an individual part. So randomized control trials that compare one drug or one surgery to another or to a placebo to see how that affects one part. Of course, um, both of these systems are necessary, so not to put one over the other. 
who does this research? There's actually a huge amount of acupuncture research, probably more for this discipline than any other complementary uh, or integrative medical system. Uh, China and other East Asian countries are a major source of this research. And the people who do the research are in major hospitals and medical centers all over the world uh, because they have seen that acupuncture can actually be a very important complementary modality to Western medicine. The funders are major insurance companies uh, besides uh, in uh, in East Asian countries where the countries themselves support the research. Uh, in Germany, major insurance companies uh, are important funders as well as the national healthcare system in England and NCCIH here in the United States. Again, before because uh, insurance companies see that this is a very cost-effective treatment. In the United States, it helps to be an R1 research center, which means a major medical center or university. Uh, however, acupuncture research can be done by acupuncture schools on a smaller scale. For example, this research was funded by volunteer time and by the scholarly and research requirements of uh, MUIH and the other schools. And it's also possible to find funding from foundations. So there are lots of challenges in acupuncture research. First of all, it is a multimodal intervention. Yes, we use needles, but we also use moxa, which is an herb that warms the point. We use bodywork techniques such as cupping and gua sha. We recognize that the patient practitioner relationship is of utmost importance and the environment in which we work is of utmost importance. So of all of these things, what is the active ingredient? And even if you just look at the acupuncture itself, there are many different ways to put a needle in the body. You can use uh, manual stimulation, or you can put an electrical current on that needle, uh, which makes it something a little bit different, electroacupuncture. You can just press the point. You can use something called trans electrical acupuncture stimulation, or you can even activate the point using lasers. So what is it that we are studying and, and which one is best? Do they all do the same thing? So that's a challenge. Then another very big challenge is that the treatments are individualized and they change over time based on changes in the patient. So whereas a randomized controlled trial can look at one intervention and see how it affects a patient, here, the intervention changes over time. Different acupuncture points are used, um, and, and so a challenge to study. Every stimulation of a point has an effect, so controls are problematic. And then in Western medicine, randomized controlled trials are the gold standard, but they're not the best way to study a complex intervention like acupuncture with so many moving parts. So all um, uh, science begins with observation. I'm gonna be talking now about, my, about the project that I was involved in. Uh, all science begins with observation and this is what I observed. My students were falling asleep when I was teaching my research course. So all research begins with a question. And my question was, how can I make this topic interesting so that my patients don't fall asleep? And that question took me on a five-year journey. Uh, some other questions I asked, what are the critical topics that need to be covered? 
What do other acupuncture research teachers do? How do other acupuncture schools approach this topic? What do acupuncture researchers have to say about this? So I started with, I started answering these questions with the premier acupuncture research association, which is a society for acupuncture research. Uh, they are an international group they focus on research done by major hospitals, medical centers, and universities, primarily R1 research institutions, and traditionally did not include acupuncture and herbal medicine, medical schools generally. So uh, here is my research journey. It started with the 2017 SAR Society of Acupuncture Research Conference. That conference was fabulous. Presentations from, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering on uh, acupuncture for cancer patients and many other major medical hospitals and uh, major medical uh, schools. Uh, but nothing for teachers of acupuncture. So I began at that point lobbying the SAR board. I called up the president, no, I emailed the president of SAR and I said, can you please provide something at the next conference for research educators, even if it's just a room that we can meet in and share information on what we're, each of us is doing. And I continued that lobbying for two years because they have their conferences every two years. So I proposed an educators workshop for a 2019 conference. And they came back to me and instead offered me a full day pre-conference workshop, which was fabulous. So I got a group of people together that I had met at previous SAR conferences and we put together a full day pre-conference workshop on how to teach acupuncture research. At that time, the SAR Special Interest Group on Education was formed. This was at the June 2019 conference. Uh, and I became the chair of that group. And the first thing I did was create a Google Drive. So uh, this group, which uh, included people from all over the country and Brazil, so an international group of uh, research educators, uh, could collaborate. And then the second thing I did was put up a document that said, what are you interested in? And out of that document came two separate projects a survey to assess East, uh, acupuncture student interest in acupuncture research. And the second was developing a model acupuncture research curriculum. So these two tracks uh, continued simultaneously. First for the survey, we, I created a separate Google file. We started with a survey of acupuncture students done in 2012 and worked on updating it. We got uh, uh, MUIH, the Scientific Review Committee approval and then IRB uh, uh, approval. Uh, we searched for acupuncture program director names. I call this out specifically because you would think that a national organization might share it with us, but unfortunately, uh, no national acupuncture research organization did that. So I had to personally search the web for all uh, 50 plus uh, acupuncture schools and acupuncture program directors. And then we sent a letter to them all. At the same time, uh, we were developing this research curriculum. We started with a slideshow of one of our members. I added the existing MUIH research course topics. We worked on refining and improving this uh, a curriculum with contributors from across the United States and Brazil. We identified subject matter experts and stakeholders 
And then the SAR board approved the project and agreed to be signatories to the letter requesting feedback from the subject matter experts and stakeholders. What do you think about this curriculum that we have developed? And that SAR board uh, support was critically important because we were asking major researchers from across the world. I don't think they would have uh, replied to me so quickly as they would have applied to a letter signed by the SAR board. So that was really critically important. And then our work continued with the survey. We sent out a letter to program directors asking them to send out the survey to their students and then reminder emails and then reminder calls. And we discovered we weren't getting enough participation. So we had to ask our IRB for a revision to extend our outreach to uh, social media. And then we sent out a, uh, and uh, extend our timeline. We sent out another letter to program directors. We had to go to a second IRB revision for their approval to offer incentives to students. A remind, another reminder email and another reminder call. Um, and then for the model curriculum, we sent out letters to the uh, subject matter experts, stakeholders, reminder emails, reminder calls, collected all the feedback and began the work of determining major themes from the feedback we received. And then one of the comments on uh, from a subject matter expert was, you need to include students in this uh, model curriculum outreach because they're important stakeholders. And I said, oh my goodness, we already have included students. Uh, they, we took a survey, uh, we did a survey for the students of the students. And so both of these projects have merged. Students are an important group of stakeholders in the development of a model research curriculum. And that now we have submitted a yet another revision to our IRB to include subject matter experts and stakeholders in our project. And this is a five-year timeline that's just meant to show you how long research takes. So on the left-hand side are all of the different uh, tasks, uh, activities that I just went through. And across the top, uh, it starts in May of 2017 and goes by quarters all the way up to the present. And uh, this just really shows you how, how long research takes uh, you know, first my lobbying and then uh, the educators workshop, the formation of SAR, which makes me very happy in 2019. Um, and then a long time just working on developing the model curriculum and the survey. And then just jumping to the present, the work really begins now. We have just collected the data we have not begin to, begun to analyze it. So the work uh, has uh, just begins. So the results to date, we have the data from the survey of acupuncture uh, students assessing their attitudes towards research. We finally got 467 students from 36 out of 52 schools. We developed a list of topics to be covered in an acupuncture research course. We have key lessons learned from our subject matter experts from across the world and key structure, structures suggested from our stakeholders, including national organizations and students. So some of the feedback from subject matter experts and stakeholders, uh, specifically, Standard research tools are one way of knowing and understanding the world, and there are other ways to know the world and take the complexity of the body, mind, spirit, and environment into account. Students benefit from knowing Eastern and Western worldviews and being able to speak two languages, 
to know the drawbacks of the standard research tools when applied to acupuncture, to know the importance of scientific data and how to apply it in their practices. It's important to acknowledge the different mindsets of practitioners and researchers. And research has been shown uh, to be uh, that acupuncture is effective in treating, among other things, acute and chronic pain, nausea and vomiting, side effects of cancer, and cancer treatments. And this is directly from, again, the major researchers in hospitals who have seen it work with their patients. And then, of course, we have more questions from all of this. How do new research findings regarding best acupuncture practices get disseminated to practicing acupuncturists? How do practitioners keep themselves current on best ways to help their patients? These are questions, of course, that are common to every medical specialty, but it all starts with educating students. So here are some particular lessons learned from my research project. First of all, to say yes. Uh, I believe it was spring of 2016 that James Snow, uh, our um, uh, academic dean, asked me to teach our research course. And I thought this was a very bad idea. I was not trained as a researcher, and I said, there, there are better researchers here. And he said, it's important for the students to see that a practitioner, an acupuncture practitioner, is also interested in research. So some people can say no to James, but I am not one of them. Uh, I said yes, and that started me on this five-year journey. Lesson two, research takes a long time and a lot of time. As you can see, this was a five-year process just to the point of starting the data analysis. Um, and it fills up all time that you have. For that reason, you really need to love your topic uh, because there will be many times uh, over the years that you will say, this is way too big for me. Um, uh, so you need that love to have you keep on going, to give you the energy to keep on going. Lesson three, Google Drive and Google Docs are amazing. It allowed for this international group of uh, research educators to collaborate uh, across uh, time and th all through the COVID epidemic. Uh, we were not stopped by it at all, I would say. So Google, I mean, truly amazing in its um, ability to support collaboration. Lesson four, MUIH support for research is really outstanding. First of all, we have a great process set up. Anybody who, who is like not a researcher like myself, if you've got a research idea, you, you can apply to the scientific uh, research committee, the SRC, and they will help you refine your idea uh, and uh, ask all kinds of questions. And then you can proceed on to an application to the IRB, our Institutional Review Board, which again will look at uh, the research that you've structured and make suggestions on how to improve it. And then secondly, uh, ranked faculty have a scholarship uh, research and scholarship track where a certain percentage of our time has to be spent on research and scholarship activities. So MUIH really financially supported this research by allowing some of my time to be spent on this activity. So a, a deep bow of thanks to MUIH. Lesson five, uh, research is best done by a team, and here is my team. Um, uh, Belinda Anderson below me, Lisa Conboy right next to me, and uh, Rosaline Ostrick 
uh, diagonally below me. You can see by their credentials, they're really all outstanding researchers. I was, I'm so lucky and honored to be able to work with them. So deep bow to them also. Lesson six, getting people to fill out a survey is very, very difficult. I think I would rather climb this stone wall than get people to fill out a survey. We had to uh, make um, you know, uh, many, seven different reminder emails, two personal phone calls by me to every single program director, uh, financial incentives. So uh, don't overestimate your response rate. Lesson seven, make your request personal, simple, and easy to fulfill. So I'm not proud to say that our first request was originally going to be a seven-page document that you see just the first page on the left of the screen in small type. We were about, or I was about to send this out to again, very busy researchers from across the world, seven pages of very small type. And I sent it to my research team and said, this is about to go out. And Rosaline immediately texted me back and said, wait, are we really asking people to read a seven page document of very small type? So instead we got it down to one page that you see on the right hand screen uh, with three questions. And we said, you can add your comments to this document. You can put them on a separate document or just call us and let us know what your uh, answers are. So we made it very, very simple for them to respond. Our next steps, uh, the survey is complete, the data is being analyzed, feedback is received from over 90% of our subject matter experts and stakeholders. The team needs to collect the data and figure out how to best present the information. We have to disseminate the information to schools, create a list of standalone presentations on key topics, for example, different ways of knowing. We have to discuss with our national accreditation board if their existing standards concerning research can be expanded and discuss what papers to write and which journals to aim for and then write the papers. And then most importantly, I'm happy to say that my students woke up. Uh, it's a difficult course and maybe not all of them are totally thrilled with it, but at least they are involved and interested. Uh, finally, I want to uh, thank many people who were involved in this project. The MUIH administration, first of all, the entire research team at MUIH, including Dr. Stephanie Munez, Daryl Nault, Mary Beth Mesenda, and all the people who serve on the SRC and the IRB. I want to thank the Society for Acupuncture Research, my team members, uh, and all of the acupuncture directors who sent out the surveys, all of the acupuncture students who completed the surveys, and my students, uh, without whom this project would never have started. And I thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Heidi, for sharing that um, and for really walking us through your process. And we look forward to seeing what comes of the next steps once the, I mean, you know, the real work, there's a lot that goes into everything that you've done so far. So uh, when you say the journey begins, you're well into your journey, but um, here, here's where you get to see the fruit that it bears. So we have a bunch of questions. Um, the first one is about whether acupuncture can be personalized. And so I don't know if that's a cl about cl the clinical approach to acupuncture or about acupuncture in research. I know that oftentimes there's an objection that 
acupuncture in research is protocolized versus being personalized. So can you speak to that a little? Yes. Um, so acupuncture itself, of course, is individualized. Absolutely. And that has been a tremendous challenge with research. So to date, acupuncture research, because it's done by major medical institutions, they do it in the same way with randomized controlled studies as they do for drugs, but it doesn't work for acupuncture. So uh, we are, uh, some people have already developed um, ways to do research that encompass the entire unique intervention. And it's kind of like a black box, um, taking people and looking at where they started and where they ended up. Uh, and then, so not breaking down the acupuncture research into parts. There's something called complexity science that one of our team members, Lisa Conboy, is uh, trying to develop for use with acupuncture research, certainly uh, qualitative studies that ask how a person feels about the process and um, if their quality of life has improved. Those are all important tools to use. And when I'm finished facilitating this, I can add um, a citation to the chat. Um, the study that I actually, Tanisha and I received the uh, poster award for, also has a flexible acupuncture protocol. Um, so it allows the acupuncture provider to make selections in the way that care is provided. Um, Heidi, did you find anything published on the topic of research curriculum in acupuncture? And if so, were those published in acupuncture journals or in education journals? Uh, so, no, we didn't. We looked at curriculum from other health care modalities, but there really wasn't anything for acupuncture uh, research curriculum. No, there wasn't. Uh, I'm sorry, there was. <laughs> and uh, that was, um, uh, there were surveys that were done by another one of our team members, Belinda Bo Anderson, who um, had done surveys of both faculty and students. There, were, uh, there was an NIH grant round to several acupuncture schools, and I believe 2012, that looked at how to develop acupuncture research education. And so we looked at all of that information. I, I believe that Bo's work looking at that was a keynote at the research symposium a few years back. So for those of you who yes. are interested, you could go into the archives and, and listen to Dr. Anderson's talk. Um, do you think that this approach could be effectively applied to research other types of curricula in a particular field like um, research and developing model intercultural competence curricula in health and wellness or medical fields? Oh, and, you know, totally. Absolutely. That's, that's why I'm excited to present this here. It really is a process and we've learned like I could tell you how to improve our process. <laughs> uh, and it's absolutely applicable to other complementary medicine fields that want to. And actually anybody who's trying to develop a curriculum on a particular area, it's amazing to be able to reach out to subject matter experts and stakeholders and say, what do you think is the best way to do this? So. Yeah. So along those lines, there's another question about your process and reflecting on it. If you were to do it again, what are some things that you would do differently? That's a great question. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the things is that we did not 
have a, a research plan in mind, I would say. Here is the difference between uh, practitioners and researchers because I was kind of the driving force at the beginning, my whole thing was practical. I want to develop a research curriculum so I can teach my course better. But that's actually quite different from what would be the goal of a researcher. So to have the researchers involved in um, uh, creating the goal from the beginning, I think would have improved the whole process. And then there were just like little uh, things, you know, about uh, don't overestimate the number of people who re will respond to your survey, right. uh, you know, make things personal. Yeah. Great. Simple. Okay. One more question for you, Heidi, and thank you for taking these. Um, so, what you've done so far is about building a model curriculum. Do you have plans to measure the effectiveness of applying that curriculum? And if so, um, what does that look like? What are your What are your thoughts? So, such an important question. And here is an opportunity for us to do something that we didn't do at the beginning, which is have a research plan now um, for, uh, I mean, we haven't really, we have not developed yet what we would like as a list of topics for acupuncture schools to do. So we have to develop that, but then we have to have a plan for disseminating the information and, uh, and uh, uh, measuring its effect, absolutely. So we know that we have to do that, but we have not developed it yet. And thank you for the reminder. <laughs> Wonderful. So that made it extend your timeline a little bit more. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Heidi, for sharing your work with us and congratulations again on the award. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to our Dean, Dr. James Snow, who'd like to say something additional before we move on. Thanks, Stephanie. And so, um, so just before uh, Stephanie presents the research update, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge her for all the work she's done for MUIH. Um, as many of you know, Stephanie has moved on from her formal role as the director as the department chair for research here at MUH very recently. And in many ways, I think you, the research update is arguably the final like formal uh, presentation that you'll do in relationship to that role. Um, it, thankfully, Stephanie is staying on as an adjunct. So we're all very excited about that. And we'll continue to collaborate with her in her new role. But uh, I was thinking about what I would say today. and. And, I, and if someone was to ask me, like, what are, what are some of the best things that you've done as the most important things you've done as the Dean of Academic Affairs, uh, I'd say that hiring Stephanie would definitely be pretty high on that list uh, because she has really, um, she came in here um, trusting us that we were interested in conducting research, interested in developing a research curriculum. We really had an idea and Stephanie in a very methodical way helped build and was a primary driver for a strategic plan for building research at MUIH. And um, really, I think you're seeing here today a lot of her legacy, which is um, Heidi wouldn't have been presenting today, wouldn't be as interested, wouldn't be as engaged if it hadn't been for Stephanie. Um, you know, we have a, a well-functioning IRB, we've got a scientific review committee, we've got journal clubs for students and faculty, we've got research groups for students and faculty. We've got a whole bunch of faculty who are doing work and have learned from Stephanie and been mentored by Stephanie. I think about Marlisa Sullivan, who really knew very little about research when she started here. And really, I think under your guidance has really built a remarkable, um, you know, it's just one of the many people who's built a remarkable set of work under your guidance. And I know Daryl probably has something to say about that as well in a little while here. So, Stephanie, I just really wanted to take the time to formally thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you. Um, and uh, in England, I think one of the one of the ways that people show um, some uh, 
you know, some uh, love for people is by using last names to refer to people. So you are definitely one of the people I refer to as Munaz on a regular basis. So, um, so you know, thank you on a personal level for everything you've done. <laughs> yeah, now you got to talk. That's my yeah, final thanks. gift to you. <laughs> thanks a lot, James. <laughs> <sighs> thank you for that. Um, it means a lot. Thank you for believing in me and um, creating this role for me to step into for these past few years. Okay, so I'm going to share the research update, which is an annual tradition here at our research symposium, which is to give a shout out to research that has been published by our faculty over the past year. So this is not a calendar year or a fiscal year. It's a symposium year, which means that it's anything that's been published since our last research symposium. So since last March, I often, or I always every year get requests in the chat. Can we have this list? Where is the list? Can we get access to that research? And the answer of course is yes. We actually have a page on the MUIH website that has our faculty research by year. What I'm sharing with you tonight is not there yet because it's once I've given this presentation that then I share that list with the marketing team and it goes up on the website. So be patient with me, but you will be getting that list soon. Okay, so let me switch over to this document. So this is in no particular order, except that I sort of grouped it by, um, by research researcher um, for, for easier presenting. So I'm gonna start by sharing about some of the work that's been conducted by Dr. Justin Morris, who's the chair of our um, health and wellness coaching department. A recent paper on health literacy Education in Speech Language Pathology, published in the MedCrave Online Journal of Public Health, and then another paper um, on exercise causality, orientation, motivation, and adherence in an incentive walking program, published in the Journal of Physical Activity Research. Uh, Dr. Liz Amen, who's in the Health and Wellness Coaching Department, along with Mary Beth Masinda and a few other colleagues outside of MUIH published a focus group study, qualitative study on ADH coaching and interprofessional communication, which can be found in the International Journal of Evidence-Based Coaching and Mentoring. Dr. Catherine Smith uh, has a paper that's actually in press now. So this is um, our freshest of the list. It's not even available yet, but will be soon. And that is the effects of health and wellness coaching with an adult cancer caregiver, a case report. There were also two research presentations uh, by Dr. Catherine Smith that are published in Global Advances in Health and Medicine as abstracts. One of those with a bunch of MUIH co-authors, including uh, Claudia Wingo, Rebecca Pile, uh, Chelsea Barrett, Amanda Brion, uh, and Kimberly Davis. That includes faculty, staff, and students. And that is an individualized worksite wellness program at a small integrative health university, a one-year follow-up. So that is research conducted on a workplace wellness program here at MUIH. And then Dr. Catherine Smith also uh, gave a presentation on the feasibility and acceptability of health and wellness coaching for neuroendocrine tumor patients and their caregivers, also available in Global Advances. The next group of publications is by myself and Daryl Nault, along with an international team of researchers. And those are all related to the development of research reporting guidelines for yoga research. This is one of those projects that James Snow told me to do, and I couldn't say no. And it took me a lot of years. I wrote Daryl into it halfway through the project. And um, finally, all of that hard work paid off with three publications so far, all published in the last year including the development of the Clarify 
guidelines, a Delphi study, the Clarify 2021 explanation and elaboration, and a commentary piece on releasing Clarify, a new guideline for improving yoga research transparency and usefulness. Um, additionally, another project that has me as an author includes a collaboration between MUIH and uh, Montefiore, Einstein, and Sinai Hospitals in New York City. One of the authors on here is Dr. Bo Anderson, who's working with Heidi on her project as well. And that includes the project that won the Faculty Poster Award, which is the combination of an acupuncture group intervention plus a yoga therapy intervention, both with flexible protocols to treat chronic pain in a community healthcare setting. So one of those papers is um, the about the barriers and facilitators to implementing that bundled intervention. Another is a qualitative analysis of the experiences of participants in that intervention. Moving on, there are a couple of papers out this year by Marlisa Sullivan, um, now Dr. Marlisa Sullivan, which um, James mentioned earlier. One of those also included myself and Daryl Nault, and that is a paper publishing some research from a landmark study that um, informed policy at the VA, but was not published until now. And so that is yoga meditation for active duty military members with post-traumatic stress disorder results in discussion of a landmark initial study. And then Dr. Sullivan also worked with a team of collaborators outside of MUIH on a pilot study of the acceptability, feasibility, and safety of yoga for chronic pain and sickle cell disease. Last but absolutely not least, Hunter Thompson with his very first peer-reviewed research paper that just got discussed in Faculty Journal Club. We're so excited for Dr. Thompson and this accomplishment. And that is acupuncture treatment for a patient with stage four metastatic cancer, a case report published in Convergent Points, which is a new uh, journal for case reporting in this field. So that is my research update. And I believe now I'm going to turn it over to Daryl before I do some acknowledgements and then we close. Indeed, can everybody hear me? <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> um, so we've talked a little bit about this research symposium website and we thought that it would probably be a good idea to introduce you all to it so everybody knows how to interact and comment with the posters that are on it. Um, we do also have instructions on the homepage of this site itself. Uh, just, you know, you don't have to remember all of these instructions as I'm reading them, but just to show you all. Uh, so we will continue, pretty much be continuing this asynchronously through April 15th. Uh, visit this poster website and you can engage with the poster authors themselves on their research. So navigating to the site, uh, we have this top navigation panel up here. You're going to go into the individual study types that you'd like to explore. And this is this year's um, submitters. You know, we can see here uh, Stephanie's abstract here. When you find one that you want to read, click on continue reading. And some of them do contain recordings as well, if you'd like to view their recordings, but they should also contain a faculty poster or a, a poster in general, not just a faculty poster. Uh, so you can view the posters. And when you're ready, if you would like to leave a commentary for the authors of the posters, you come on down to leave a reply, type it in, excellent poster and post your comment. And it'll probably go a little bit quicker because I assume you're not gonna be recording and using Zoom at the same time. So when you're ready, uh, you know, feel free to come on in here, check out the posters. Everybody's put a lot of really hard work into this. Um, so comment with them, talk to them. The authors will be on here throughout the week as well, answering you know, questions or comments. Uh, and we'd really love to see you all interact with one another. Authors, please don't forget to check in so you can answer questions that are coming in uh, and respond to any comments. 
Uh, these are uh, wonderful points to connect with people who are interested in your research. And uh, just in case anyone forgets, we do also have these instructions, as I was saying on the homepage. You scroll on down to instructions and this will open up what I pretty much just read to you. It also has a couple of images as well to help you along. Now, quickly before I hand the mic back to Stephanie, I want to give a shout out and a huge thank you to Dr. Cheryl Van Lair and Mary Beth Masunda for all of their hard work on this website in particular this year. Putting this symposium together is really very much a team effort and this, this team is fabulous. Uh, it's not every day that you find yourself on a team where your monthly meetings are an equal balance of task lists and laughter, but none of us would be here if it weren't for the spectacular leadership of Dr. Munaz. So since this is our last symposium leading us, I wanted to say a few words of gratitude. So over the past five symposiums, Dr. Munaz has shown me what it means to be a leader and a mentor by encouraging others in their personal growth. She's now led us through our third year of pandemic forced will they or won't they be in person <laughs> events <laughs> and demonstrated how to persevere through those last minute changes with both grace and creativity. Stephanie, your presence as our MC and at our monthly meetings will be greatly missed, uh, but you have infused this event with your love of science, your love of learning and community. So I know you will always be a part of the symposium's heart. As usual, I'll speak for everyone on the steering committee when I say thank you for everything. And now I'm gonna hand it back to you, Dr. Munoz, to wrap us up. You all make it very difficult to speak. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Okay, I want to thank the steering committee for this event. This event, we start planning it. We give ourselves a month off. You know, we have a debrief sort of right after brainstorm things we want to think about for next year. We have one month off and then we basically jump right into planning for the next year. So it's a whole year long process to get to what you're experiencing tonight and this week. So I want to thank Daryl Nall, Mary Beth Masinda, Cheryl Van Lair, Rebecca Pule, Christine Chirpak and Rachel Voss, who recently agreed to help support this event going forward. So thank you to all of you for all your long-standing commitment. Some of you have been doing this for multiple years and keep coming back. I also want to thank the IRB leadership, Daryl Nault and Marlisa Sullivan. Many of the projects that I shared in the research update went through our IRB at MUIH. And for those of you who are interested in conducting research or you're not sure if your project needs an IRB or if it's human subjects research or what it requires, they are always available for questions. No question is silly um, or too simple or too complicated. So please contact them with any questions about conducting research as an affiliate of MUIH. I want to thank all of the presenters, including tonight's speakers, as well as this week's poster presenters who are going to be engaging with us throughout the week about their work. And I especially want to thank Ms. Middleton uh, for joining us and serving as our keynote speaker. Congratulations to the award winners, including Dr. Heidi Most. And our poster awardees are excellent DCN students. And Tanisha Luthria, who is an undergraduate student at Johns Hopkins, who had major contributions to make in our award-winning poster. So well done. I also want to thank the faculty at MUIH who champion research literacy and engagement in their courses through mentorship outside of the classroom, going above and beyond what is required out of a passion and a commitment to research literacy and the conduct of research in integrative health. Those who participate in the research activities at MUIH and represent MUIH in the larger integrative health research world, including the faculty in our research department, which is now fearlessly led by Dr. Dustin Morris. I also want to thank the leadership, um, including Mark and Chris and James for their unwavering support of this event and research activity at MUIH. Uh, while James gave me a lot of the credit for what has grown at MUIH in recent years, none of that would have happened if it weren't for James having a vision for what research could be at MUIH and literally 
going out to find me and bring me back to fill that role. So, um, so thank you, James, for your vision and your support and for having that quality that um, makes it impossible to say no to you. I want to remind everyone that you don't have to wait until next year or until abstracts are due to think about research here at MUIH. We have, as James mentioned, journal clubs and research groups for faculty, for students and alumni. The journal clubs and research groups meet once a month. I get questions from students and alumni about these, the way to find out about the topics being discussed at Journal Club. The article and the questions to consider are in the provost updates that come out to you regularly. So please don't um, forget to look those over because that's where you're gonna find out what we're talking about in Journal Club and it might just entice you to join us. We always record the Student Journal Club. So those are available to review afterwards if you're not able to make it in person. Journal Club is where we talk about literature that's already been published and get to be more literate and think about methodology and how to apply it clinically. The research groups are where we talk about research that we want to do or that we're engaged in. And so if you have a research idea or you're excited about something or you just wanna learn about how the sausage is made, come to research group. For faculty who are interested in coming to Journal Club and Research Group, there is a team for that. So if you're interested in joining the team so that you get notified about the faculty Journal Club and Research Group, please contact Mary Beth Masinda. She is now running the Journal Club and Research Group, and we're grateful that she has taken on that role. I also want to remind you all that I am not leaving. I'm just transitioning to a different role. So I look forward to seeing everyone in the poster session this week and also in all kinds of research related activities going forward at MUIH. So thank you all for being here, um, for engaging with us. To those who are watching the recording, thanks for taking the time to engage with us after the fact. We look forward to interacting with you all week long in the poster session. Uh, and please reach out to us anytime. Um, I'll share that there is a survey now posted by Mary Beth in the chat. So before you log off, if you could please click on that form that's in the chat uh, so that we can get your feedback because you know that we're gonna be meeting very shortly to discuss next year's event. So tell us, um, tell us what you appreciated, tell us what we could do even better. You know, um, next year in person, we hope, maybe in person and online, um, but we'll, we'll see you there one way or another. <laughs>